and welcome again of, to those of you who have just joined the call. Um, I am going to literally kick off festivities by introducing our panelists. This is the first time I'm doing an online version of a discussion, so I am so excited. First up, I'm going to be a bit biased, Martin Dreyer, which is a research analyst from the Northwest University Potterstrom campus based in South Africa. Welcome. Second, Dr. Margaret Brever, educational scientist at the Research Data Alliance. Um, she is usually based in Addis Abda in Ethiopia, but currently in Austria. Dr. David perez Ruiz, a senior research software developer at the University College London, all the way from United Kingdom. Hello. And last but definitely not least, um, Rohit Goswami from Iceland, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Iceland. So it's amazing to have everyone on the call. I am going to quickly just explain how we're going to run the rest of this portion of the call. We have a couple of prompts. If you scroll down from line 79, we're going to run through the prompts and leave a good 30 minutes at the end of this call for questions. So if you have any questions, please add it into the chat or on line 97 in the etherpad so it's easily accessible for us. Um, Sarah and I are going to try and catch everything in the chat and paste it there for us. So I want to kick off our discussion with regards to instructor experiences of online teaching by giving more or less an open question or asking an open question rather. Um, what worked? I am going to call on David first. David, I, I'm sorry, I'm not picking on you. Apologies, right? David, please go ahead, share with us what worked with regards to online workshops, um, which you taught. Yeah, so for me, um, everything worked, maybe. Uh, the, I found it like, it was not as much difference I mean, we prepare for it and we, we test a few things beforehand and I, and we will talk later about with resources we write and stuff, but the, uh, most of the stuff worked uh, well. So it worked well the interaction, it worked well the, the, um, the how we were spying on the students to see how much they were doing and how well they were going. Uh, but at the same time, I must say that maybe the expectations were not too high because it was like, two weeks after the lockdown started and and maybe people were more permissive on saying okay this is not perfect but still we are learning something um but i think that yeah except one thing that i will tell you later which is the breakout rooms <laughs> uh, everything worked uh, as we had planned it before and that was using a blackboard collaborate 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 i think uh, which is what we use in our, in our university. And then a Google document instead of an editor path, so people could post uh, screenshots if they need it, and a tool called Shellshare uh, to spy the students. And pretty much, I, I didn't find it much different of what it's a normal, um, mo more problems than in a normal workshop. Right. Thank you, David. Um, so um, maybe I can summarize, you say converting from a normal in-person workshop was not much different to running an online workshop with the um, you know, exception to the shell and on a Google Docs or something of the sort. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Rohit. Can you go ahead and share with us? Hello again. Um, what worked well in the workshops you taught online? Well, um... I was surprised. Um, so at first I, I, I didn't know how it would go because like uh, a lot of times you need to be there in person to make sure people are following along and all that. But uh, I ended up leveraging Jamboard uh, to draw squiggles and everybody just really started scribbling very enthusiastically. And then I was able to call on the learners to like, you know, draw their mental models. And I think that really worked well. And um, that's something which you don't always get in an in-person workshop. So yeah, I mean, that worked really well. The flip side of it, uh, I mean, maybe there's more on that later, was that, well, mm, some people felt that the teaching was a little ad hoc because they weren't really slides, they were, you know, scribbles. So, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Road. I shared a link to Jamboard. I have taught with Road online myself, and I have seen the scribbles and the students' feedback was great. They really enjoyed that. Martin, can you go ahead and share what well, worked well in online workshops you taught recently? Okay, there's, we have two Martins on, on the call, so just remain, remember that. Thank um, you. Okay, um, I think what worked well was the fact that we had helpers. We had, a, I want to say, a head instructor, sort of, uh, which you filled in one, once or twice. Um, so every day we, that we had uh, the workshop, we had somebody um, that looked after everybody. So I was teaching, for instance, and then um, Angelique had a, a looked after the questions and she um, managed the breakout rooms. And if somebody had the issue, we had a helper that could go into the breakout room, sort out the issue and um, get the person up to speed and come back. We also had um, a few helpers. Um, some of my colleagues helped. And then the biggest thing, I think, the, the, the best thing that we could take, away, could take away from was the half-day sessions. The full-day sessions, we found that after lunch, people got really, really tired and sort of irritated in, in, a, in a sense. So the half-day sessions worked very well. And then they had the afternoon to go and do work or um, catch up on emails or, or even go through the, the work again that we did the, the morning. Whereas with the two full day sessions, you had full days after um, five in the afternoon, people are tired, people don't want to actually want to partake anymore. So um, yeah, I think that with the half day sessions was, was the best thing for me. And um, we didn't really have negative feedback. We had some awesome feedback um, with regards to the, the online sessions. And uh, I think the, the thing that, that, made it so positive was the fact that we had somebody that could look after everybody while somebody else is teaching. Thank you so much, Martin. Maybe just from my side, um, I call it a technical instructor, someone looking after the Zoom room, but uh, on Slack, those of you who saw Rosa from Sweden shared Zoom DJ, and that is probably the term of the month. I'm just loving it because it feels like you are literally DJing in between all the different um, parts of Zoom. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to hand over to Sarah, who will be discussing the next prompt. Thank you, Angelique. And all these are really great. Thank you um, to our panelists for sharing. Um, my question to you is, um, which areas did you particularly find that you struggled with um, in your online setting? And um, particularly things that you did that you would prefer to do differently in future workshops? We can start um, with Rohit. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like um, more or less things worked out well. I mean, I'm not really sure what I would do differently, but I felt like uh, I got the pacing very badly off um, in the sense that people just needed more time. You know, when, when you're not there to direct them in person, then, then people get lost more often. And yes, you can put them into breakout rooms and the helpers are fantastic, but um, it's still kind of needs to be taken into account, which I feel like I didn't do very well in the beginning, at least. So next time I'll, I'll be more cognizant of that. Okay. And how many people did you have in your workshop? Mm, maybe Angelique could answer that one better. I think South African, oh, sorry, I'm just I'm really chiming in. In South African workshops, we have between six and 10 individuals joining mm -hmm. um, in various workshops. So I know Rohit was present in one of the South African ones and it's more or less that amount, yeah. Awesome, thank you for sharing Rohit and Angelique for jumping in. Um, Margaret, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Yes, I have a completely different um, experience because um, in Ethiopia today is the first day that uh, internet is open again after 15 days lockdown. No internet at all. We tried to prepare um, an online 
teaching on R together with the, the WACRAN, the, the Western and Central African uh, Research and Education Network. And uh, we were discussing quite a lot about that and now the Ethiopians should have prepared everything because it should become an African uh, training and not uh, with uh, Western teachers. And uh, nothing happened. Today, the first day that the landline works again, Wi-Fi doesn't work uh, right now. And otherwise, um, yeah, we have uh, different uh, situations. That means we, we also have uh, uh, the infrastructure, what does not work. We have the power cuts, we have then the bandwidth, we have uh, uh, the, the students uh, not able to, to work with uh, laptops. We have to go for the smartphones. What is all possible, we solved all that. Uh, we can use Moodle, we can use the apps from Moodle. But if the infrastructure itself doesn't work, then we are in a limbo. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. That, that must be very difficult. Um, so you said internet is back now? After 14 days lockdown, mm -hmm. no internet worked. Satellite internet worked last week, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it was not accessible for everyone. Okay. Thank you for sharing, uh, Margaret. Also asks, and I, I wonder if this is a question for Margaret, um, how do you manage audio visuals on mobile, I, I can imagine. It, it's, a, it's a question to me. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, we are starting oh. with that. Um, we, we have done, or I have done quite some literature review because uh, everything is supported from the ministry. Uh, Ethiopia is a very centralized country. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's in the ministry's interest that we reach out to the students, mm -hmm. that uh, students use their um, mobile phones. Um, we have not really the concept right now, but the literature review has been done and we learn from the experience from others. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Margaret. Um, this is a really difficult challenge um, and I appreciate your sharing. Um, David, I'd like to hear from you. What challenges did you face? So the main challenges that we had was the breaking rooms and that was a problem with the platform in particular. Like it's, it was mm -hmm. too slow. So when, when, so we were using the breakout rooms for quizzes and to discuss them between the different people. And I was planning to do like many more discussions. And after the first discussion, it was so disruptive that I just decided to do the discussions in, in the main room. Now, uh, coming back to the question you were asking before, how many people we had in this yeah. workshop, we have only 10 people. So mm -hmm. there were, the discussion in the group, everyone, it was not, uh, that much of that noisier because right. it was very it was not that many people um so that didn't work that, that didn't work as i expected so mm -hmm. we didn't use it that much the thing that it, it m m was more annoying maybe was a uh, helping people out in a different room mm -hmm. like uh the helper going with a person that had a problem into different like a breakout room to help that person the right. main problem i found there is that the helper does lose a channel of, com of communication with the instructors as we normally have on a classroom mm -hmm. where the helper is, is on the side looking and at the same time looking what is going on and, and, and it yeah. could tell the student, oh, check out what is there, then I can help you later because you may lose something important. But when we were in different rooms, the person couldn't see what's going on. So we mm -hmm. were, we've were we been thinking on how to come around and do things. And all the ideas involve more technology things and more tools, which will make it kind of a more difficult for the learners. So we are we haven't found a solution for that yet. Great. Yeah, um, I, I completely um, agree and have heard from others as well, other instructors, that it it becomes cumulative. Um, that when people step aside and go into a breakout room to be helped, then they come back in and find people have moved on and then they need more help. And so it can be frustrating and finding a balance is difficult. And sometimes when that balance is found, like Rohit said, 
you have to make a decision about which bits of the lessons to leave out. So that's very useful. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, before we move on to the next question and I hand back to um, Angelique, um, I don't know if Martin has something else to add. Yeah, it's something small, but uh, quite significant. Mm -hmm. Let me just put on my, my video so you can see who's talking. Um, <laughs> Um, I think the first work workshop that we had, uh, that we did, we only had about five or six um, participants. We tried to keep it as small as possible to work out all the, the kinks and um, just to, to get a feel of the online workshop. And the first thing that that did not work was the Etherpad. So we, <laughs> we improvised and Angelique was quite fast on that and we went over to a Google Doc and the Etherpad um, didn't work for the, for two days. Um, the second one, I think the Etherpad worked quite well every now and then. So that's one small thing, but it's quite significant, especially on the online platform where you need a collaborative document, where you need a place where you can say, okay, here's the exercise, please look at it in the mm -hmm. Etherpad or look at it in, in the Google Doc. So that's one of the, the, the issues that we had. And then also our infrastructure. Um, a small part of South Africa has really, really bad infrastructure when it comes to internet. And um, it's sort of in in one place, but it's still significant in the fact that we have, we want members from that area and mm -hmm. we want people to join the carpentries, but it's not accessible at the moment for them. So that's, that's quite significant. In the, and, and we can't do anything about it. That's, that's the, the bad thing of it is we can't, um, get those people on board if they do not have access. So we had a, uh, one person that um, used her, her phone uh, to teach, for, for instance. She, she used her phone um, data and made a, a hotspot for a laptop and he, she tried to teach that way, which worked for a little while and then it didn't work and she got out every now and then. So um, it's, it's, it's a big issue that we have and, and we as the instructors can't really do anything about it. Right. Thank you so much for sharing, Martin. Um, so we've, we've heard of challenges ranging from no internet access because of political reasons, uh, like in the case of Ethiopia, which essentially means um, online workshops are not an option. And where they are, they are an option. There's still um, challenges with connectivity, um, getting people to join. And when they do join, um, then balancing um, having co-instructors and the pace with which to teach and um, how to help people so that everyone is getting everything they need from the workshop um, can also be a challenge to balance. Um, so we'll move on to the next um, item. Thank you for um, raising the question. Inigo, uh, Inigo said, um, helping us from helpers seems to be the biggest challenge by far in online workshops. And that was also his hand. Um, so I've seen that. And thank you to, um, I think it was Sarah, if I'm not wrong. Um, yes, yeah, Sarah Lynn for asking um, the panelists to share how many people were in their workshops. Um, back to you, Angelique. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I just want to add, um, Rohit made an um, addition into the chat and um, Etherpad saying he would have liked to have videos on while teaching because then he can kind of gauge nonverbal cues, right? However, because of bandwidth issues, most, I think, of all participants in the South African workshops tend to keep their videos off, also for data sparing, I want to say. So that made it a bit more difficult to navigate nonverbal cues and we used a lot of the green sticky red sticky nonverbal I want to say announcements in zoom and that that work quite well I'm seeing we are naturally um, I want to say um, not regressing but trans <laughs> moving on to the next prompt which we're asking now how do we make use of breakout rooms and David already explained that this was something he would he did not use a lot am I correct David yeah so I'm, I'm going to move on to Martin and ask Martin, were there specific instances where you did make use of breakout rooms while teaching? And when would you not make use of breakout rooms? And then if you have anything else to share about 
using breakout rooms. I've said that many times now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, from my experience, the breakout rooms can be positive and it can be negative. Um, the first workshop that we had, we found that it was quite positive. Uh, we could take, uh, because we had a small audience, we could take a coffee break and say, okay, we're gonna um, help this person, but we're gonna do it in a breakout room for a number of reasons. Um, when you're one-on-one -on -one with a person, they're more open to ask you questions. They're also more open to tell you, listen, I'm really struggling with one, two, three, and, and help me. Whereas when you have the whole audience in front of you, um, when you ask, do you have any questions? more or less the introverts never ask a question so you, either you put them on the spot and ask them a question which sometimes they won't answer or you say okay let's do a breakout room and and, and while we're doing that the rest of you take a, a five or ten minute coffee break um, on the negative side of things if you don't have people that know how to work with the breakout rooms i.e people uh, the um, instructor dj at the back that know how to set up breakout rooms you will find that that the wrong people will go into the breakout rooms. Um, if you um, look at uh, instructor training, for instance, which I've also done a few times online, the breakout rooms help immensely when you have to do the demo teaching to each other or you have to do the mind maps. And, and I don't know who of you have all done the instructor training. A, a lot of you, have, I know a lot of the, the names, not necessarily the faces, but I know a lot of the names. Um, I do see that the, the breakout rooms have value if we use them correctly, but they are not a solution. Uh, I want to say a um, one fix all solution or fits all solution. Do you, do you do sometimes get uh, problems that is a problem? The whole audience has a problem or all the participants has a similar problem, which you can just say, okay, if you have this problem, this is the way you address the problem. And if you still have issues, then we can go into the breakout room. So it's not a, I want to say it's not a go-to thing. Like if somebody has a hand up or a red, virtual red sticky up, um, they have a problem breakout room. It's a ask them what the, what the problem is, why VR personal chat or whatever. And if it's a big problem and you have somebody that can help them, then the instructor DJ at the back can say, okay, let's do a breakout room and then do that. So yes, there is a positive and a negative to the breakout rooms. Thank you so much for sharing, Martin. Um, Rayet, perhaps you have sharings or some advice on using breakout rooms in online teaching? Uh, I actually decided to not use any breakout rooms at all um, in, when I was teaching, because instead uh, I would ask them to asynchronously like write their problem down for me to just solve in my, you know, like when they were having coffee, then I'd go and I'd, or I'd just call on them. And that, that seemed to work. I mean, we didn't have too many people, so um, it was manageable. I, I felt like um, for some reason I had a lot of energy during that time. I completely forgot about giving people a rest. And so other people were more than happy to go off and have a coffee while I interacted with the, with the rest. So, yeah. Thank you so much. We have a question from Oso, and I can maybe open it up to the panel. Um, were the breakout rooms labeled? How many did you use? Maybe that had an influence in um, using or not using all the functionality thereof. I don't know, David, did you use? In our case, we were- Use more than uh, one, we tried it. So in our case, we were using, uh, as I say, we were trying to use as for discussion. So it was not a point of labeling, was, was more the time was taking me to put the people in each different room. And, and then the time was taking to go to the room and then come back. So it, in Zoom, it's a lot better. But in Blackboard Collaborate, it was really slow. And it was not a point of labeling them because it was um, just so for, the, for sending the people there and then come back. And then the next time, it might be a different uh, room for different people. Like it was to, to engage into discussions within different learners. But uh, I can see the point of uh, if you want to have more separation to label them. What we did, however, was to assign helpers to students. So in the in the other part of the Google document, we were having a list of names with the learners, sorry, with the helpers, and we were asking them to put their name under one, under each different helper, so they knew who was their helper. And we had kind of a small break room at the beginning to say hi to the helpers and then come back, I mean, um, 
but besides that, no, we didn't <laughs> play on anything. Okay, thanks. So I, I, my experience moving people around in breakout rooms, it's, you know, you know, need to know how to use breakout rooms in Zoom. So that's kind of a, a bit of a prior knowledge or maybe an expert blind spot if you are very familiar with that. And a new to online workshop instructor comes ahead and you just assume they would know how to do that. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. We have a comment in um, the chat from Sarah Stevens. If you have a group activity or discussion for exercises, learners seem to really like breakout rooms. Would have also been thinking about using them for intros, smaller group intros, and then putting one help in each room as the helper that those learners should go to if they needed help. That's great. And then she agrees with what David says. Thank you so much. Um, from a South African point of view, I have especially low bandwidth users. We have found that when I placed um, someone into a breakout room, we lost them from the call. So they would drop out and then totally lose the call and had to come in again. So um, maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit, but what we ended up doing is support. Would You would stop the lesson. You would ask them to share their screen with you. And then the whole room would then troubleshoot together. And that was a great learning experience. We really tried to incorporate that in. Maybe Martin and Road can add into that as well, because they taught in the last two online workshops in South Africa. Um, but we opted to, when it comes to R lessons, that part of the data country social sciences for R lesson, we rather had them sharing their screen with the main group uh, while the lessons I was present in. Maybe Martin or Road, if you want to chime in, please go ahead. I don't actually have any comments on that, which I've not made before, but I do see a very interesting question in the chat. I'm not really sure I understood. Spying on learners and checking on progress of exercises. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, I think this um, refers back to David. Um, comment right at the beginning. Maybe you can elaborate, David. Yeah. So one of the things we were looking in the helpers uh, when we were preparing all this, uh, the first workshop we were doing, we were like, how can we provide the helpers uh, the same kind of a, a atmosphere when you have in a classroom where you have helpers walking around and 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 looking over the shoulders of the students and and seeing whether they're on track or not. And, and when, when I'm teaching, I use them as saying, I, I tell them that they're my, my eyes on the back of the classroom. And if I see them falling, if, if they see one student falling behind and two students falling behind, then they just need to do me some kind of warning. And I'm like, okay, I have to recap something because sometimes they're shy to ask. So we were um, looking on ways to do um, how to recreate the same thing. So we use a shell share. Shell share is essentially a program that streams the shell. Uh, to a, a website. Now, this only work well for shell lessons, like the shell or the Git lesson. And so we were trying to find out to make that um, same to, tool to work on all the different operating systems and stuff. And I might say that Mike, who is here in the call as well, he was also very helpful. Um, so essentially, the students have to, hi Mike, <laughs> to run a, a command, which is a downloading a file, a Python file, and run that thing which we, it's still a, a one thing that they have to do without knowing what they're doing, but we thought that it would be better, uh, the outcome that we could receive if, if, you know, without explaining that point, which is kind of a, one of the rules that we have to break to say, okay, run this command and then it's okay. So that command provides a URL and we have the helpers, so they have to put this URL on, on this other path. And as I say, one, each, each a student half a helper and they were putting that URL. They, they, on the other side, the helpers were opening like three, five different windows uh, of the browser and, and they find a kind of a original ways of naming this. So they knew which student was there because otherwise you see like just five terminals and you don't know which one is it uh, from. And, and that was very helpful because they were looking at those things and they were chatting with me through the, through the different chat or something say, oh, David, there is a, three students that are like falling way behind and I'm like, okay, so then it's time to stop a little bit more uh, or everyone is going uh, very well. So, okay, so I can go a bit faster. So that was helping um, uh, for me as a instructor to get that view of, as I say, spying the students or looking them over the shoulder. Yeah, shelter is great. <laughs> 
thank you for sharing that, David. I found asking for green stickies and red stickies, and you would see, let's say, six of the ten not having um, or having green, and the other four you would kind of call on them and ask, um, "Are you done?" And I feel like I, you know, it's not natural calling out, um, "John, are you done? Do you need some help?" You know, so I wonder if um, that would have been. You know, that was one way of dealing and checking in the whole time and seeing if people and individuals and the learners were ready um, to go on to the next part of the lesson. So thank you for sharing that. Um, any other comments with regards to, I want to say spying on learners, but I don't really think it's exactly that. <laughs> right. No. But um, I must, yeah, please go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. It's a question for you, Angelique, to briefly expound on how you made use of green and red stickies in an online setting. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. I, did, I missed that in the um, chat. So nonverbal communication, I want to say it's a tool. I don't know if you all can see under the participants tab in Zoom, you have the yes, the no, go slower, go faster, more, I want to drink coffee. So instead of like in in-person, you have your green sticky and your red sticky, which you will have keeping up the whole time. We would ask, ah, exactly. Thank you so much for adding that. Um, yeah. And we would ask, okay, raise your green sticky. And they would click on the yes button if they're ready. If they were having troubles, they would raise the um, red sticky. If we um, asked, are we going to quick? Are we going to slow? We would ask then go slower, go faster. You could also raise a hand in the reactions tab at the bottom of the menu. So we made use a lot of that, but there were drawbacks as well because you constantly aware one or two individuals weren't done and you want to naturally ask like you would in an in-person setting, go to them and ask, are you okay? Do you need help? But now you can't do it discreetly. You kind of do it in the whole main room and I had to become really aware of just giving enough time to finish the um, challenge or the exercise and yes so that's something I walked away with trying to just be more patient mm -hmm. and I think that's what came a lot of stickies they were so grateful for the instructors who were patient and giving them the opportunity to really do their thing and go through their process as well and I hope that answered the question yeah. And on this note, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to take over from me. Awesome. Thank you, Angelique. Um, so my next question for the panelists is, um, what are the two or three main lessons that you picked up in moving um, your workshops online? We will start with uh, Martin. Uh, sorry, I I uh, broke up a little bit. Can you just repeat the, the question or the point? Yes. Um, so the question is, what are the main lessons you picked up in moving your workshops online? Okay. Uh, lessons that I learned was, <clears throat> sorry, is that you have to talk a little bit slower than usual. Um, on Sometimes I speak quite fast and I don't uh, realize it myself. And sometimes I think in Afrikaans instead of English and I will like mumble Afrikaans word and then think everybody understands it. But um, it, it all comes back to thinking in the language you're speaking in uh, does not always work when it's your second or third language. So lessons learned was speak slower, make sure you enunciate the word correctly. And if you don't know how to pronounce the word, ask. Um, Second lesson was take breaks often. Um, you, we don't realize it, but I'm an IT guy. So I sit behind the computer screen every day, the whole day. So I'm used to it, but people aren't, not everybody do that all day, every day. So they do get tired of just staring at the screen. So take breaks often. And I think in the second workshop, we try to take a break, uh, like a 10 minute break every hour. Um, or every hour and a half instead of every three hours like you would do in person or every two hours which you would do in person. So second lesson, take breaks often. Third lesson um, is try to make it interactive by asking, please put up the yes click or the red cross. Um, 
make it open. The, the first thing I always say is when I start teaching, I say I'm open to people shouting at me. So if you find that I'm talking too fast, unmute yourself and talk to me. If I don't listen, start screaming at me. I won't stress about it. Um, so yes, be open to questions anytime. I think that works for me personally. That's a personal preference. I also always ask the instructor, my fellow instructors or the instructor DJ to, to chime in when they see that I forget anything. Because teaching online is uh, the first time can be quite uh, cumbersome because you have your screen open that you want to teach. Uh, you have to share your screen. You have to get your notes. You have to make sure everything is fine. And if you only have one small screen, it can be quite cumbersome. So that's the, the one thing as well. And then one thing that we picked up was a lot of people use laptops. I think that's the, the, the I want to say the bigger populace that we work with, people use laptops. And Macs, for instance, in, in where I live, is quite expensive. So most people buy the 13-inch one, the small, very small one, because it's um, more... Um, <laughs> they are doing it again. So it, it, it they, they can um the, it, they can buy it's expensive, it. yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so um they have a really small screen. So now you have Zoom open, they have to have R open as well, or spreadsheets or whatever, and they have to look at you um sharing your screen, trying to live code. So you do miss something here and there every now and then if you have a small screen. So second or I want to say fourth lesson is try to have more than one screen. Um, instructor or participant if you can if you have that luxury luckily for me I do have two screens so I can do it quite easily but not everybody can and that can also um, become a burden on people so that's a few lessons that I've learned um, yeah I think the, the one that's, that, that I could say one which you would, should always remember is take breaks often because you get tired um, your helpers get tired the the main instructor gets tired and the participants get really tired. So yeah, and keep it short and sweet. Thank you, Martin. Um, that's all very helpful. Um, it looks like Oso's question about um, number of screens has been answered. Uh, if you aren't checking the chat, Dan, Dan Chen just shared a, a link to a blog post um, he wrote in June and that is published on the Carpentries blog about screen layouts, um, it's a very good read. Um, I recommend it, you can have a look at it. Thank you, Martin. Um, next we'll have Rohit. Um, yeah, so thank you. So for me, um, let's see. Like I, I found the Jamboard thing to be very nice, but looking at the questions, I feel like I'm going to be bringing that up a lot. So I'm kind of confused about that. So I'm going to try to say something else. Um, so when, when I migrated the resources, then I, when I was sharing my screen, I misjudged how well, and I think that is the comment which is echoed um, previously as well, that like I misjudged how much people are actually following and how much they're passively watching. Because um, you, know, you, you can wait and then eventually you have to move on with the lesson. And at that point, like until I became a little bit more strict about people, you know, voting, whether they've done it or not done it or, you know, and then often a yes, no would not suffice. You know, I would, I would write down the steps and I'd say, where are you on this, you know, sort of chart. So I think the creation of that, like that kind of micromanagement was something which I had to do and something which I learned how to do. And uh, so, for example, I'd sketch like a mental model and I'd say, okay, everybody tell me where you are here. You know, like which part of this makes sense mm -hmm. to you, doesn't make sense to you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that is something which, you know, is not a jam board. <laughs> so. Thank you, Rohit. That's very helpful. Um, I've seen in chat that Dan has typed um, that he used his phone. Um, I use my phone for my notes if I only have one screen while teaching. Uh, tabbing and swapping between notes is super distracting. Um, I've also heard from some instructors in community discussions that they print out um, 
the 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 notes and refer to them uh, to the printed out notes where possible. So uh, those are really good alternatives to know about where one screen um, only is available. Um, Angelique says I have also used my tablet for seeing the live code and coding myself on my laptop. Thank you. That's very useful input. Um, so Margaret um, and I think David, I haven't called on you. Do you have any lessons learned that you'd like to share? Yeah, from my side, um, it's not a lot uh, to share because we have the classroom uh, um, lessons and uh, these are quite successful. Yeah. But uh, with, with uh, online teaching, we have uh, almost no experience right now. Mm. Thank you, Margaret. Um, David? I think I agree with everything that uh, Martin said, uh, but in my case, it was like the, the reason of making more often breaks. So in my case, I uh, do every 55 minutes. It was, even if I'm an IT person and I'm always used to be in a computer for hours and hours, it was that now I'm in my house and my chair is not the one I have in the office. And that was like making a pain in me that they were like, okay, I have to make a break. So, um, so that was something that was helping to learners, but also helping me <laughs> on this break. So we were like uh, aiming to 55 minutes, which uh, to be fair, I was also doing that in the class recently, like the last long course I was been teaching, I was always doing uh, 55, like breaks every 55 minutes for at least mm -hmm. five and 10 minutes. Um, because also the lecture rooms, chairs that we were, I mean, it was not like for a classroom where they can uh, better chairs for the computer, but it was uh, very uncomfortable. So that was also helpful. The thing that I also learned was to get a DJ, like uh, Angelique was mentioning at the beginning, because I was the DJ, I was teaching, I was controlling everything, trying to put the people in rooms, and that was like uh, stressing. Even, even, even if I managed to do it, it was quite stressful. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, um, a lesson learned. I, fortunately, I, I had done also like a on the notes for the students before coming to the workshop. I pro, um, provide a a screenshot of how they could uh, put the screens, and I think that was helpful. Some people mentioned that in the in the in the comments. And yeah, Dan uh, blog post the other day was a quite a um, a visual confirmation that that was a good thing. Uh, now, I don't know how will I teach with something like uh, our studio. Like even I've seen the screens there and I think I cannot, I, yeah, it's, it will become too smaller. So uh, I don't know um, when that will be something I say an answer like, like, okay, that's actually uh, possible. But right now I think it, like, it scares me because it's too many windows too many things mm. to share on a smaller screen. I mean, if you have two screens, as Martin said, yes, that's great. <laughs> if you don't, eesh. Thank you so much for sharing, um, David. I, I really appreciate that. I have shared, um, because I've had the Zoom DJ role be mentioned <laughs> several times in this call, um, I've shared a link to Rosa's blog post from the Carpentries blog, uh, where she expounded on that role um, and, and, and yeah, what you can do to take on that role in your workshops. Um, so a reminder to everyone to add your questions to the question section in the etherpad. We'll be going through those shortly. Um, I'll hand it over back to Angelique for now. Thank you so much, sir. I'm going to switch question six and five around. I apologize for that. Just, um, I'm hearing a lot about live coding and being virtual right there, coding and everything. But I would like to hear more about Margaret's experience with asynchronous um, versions of workshops. I know she works a lot with WACRN and she gave, please forgive me, I can never remember the acronym. Um, I was hoping you can share with us what you and WACRN are working on currently at the moment as a form of asynchronous um, teaching of R. And I know it's based on Carpentry's lessons. I'm very biased. So <laughs> I know this information already. Perhaps, Margaret, you can go ahead and just share with us what you are doing with um, the rest of West Africa um, 
taking the carpentry's lesson to a more offline version. Uh, thank you, Angelique. In the WACRAN is West and Central African Research and Education Network. And uh, all the countries uh, from the West and uh, Central Africa are gathered in, in the WACRAN. Mm -hmm. And um, the research and education networks, the reg regional research and education networks, they uh, support the individual countries to come up with uh, the infrastructure. And now they have also Africa Connect 3 is quite a big program. Africa Connect 1 was first with the infrastructure. Uh, Africa Connect 2 was with the connectivity. Now we are at the third level and, and we try to bring life into um, the research and education networks. Mm -hmm. That means we go now beyond the infrastructure. We are focused now on the users. And the users are primarily uh, librarians for the for the vacrans, um in in the Ethiopian sense the users are primarily researchers and uh, we started with the females female researchers and we uh, created uh, somehow an umbrella and the umbrella was um, uh, digital literacy for female researchers and uh, universities were that excited about that. Every university wanted to have trainings on the carbon trees. At the end, we have delivered data carbon tree trainings. Mm -hmm. But uh, universities stepped in as sponsors. We had then also um, um, third party sponsors. And uh, we could also invite them trainers from outside to come and to deliver the trainings. And um, now Vakran is also ready to, to go for that. They want to have uh, the, the trainers uh, bringing the, the knowledge, how to work with data, uh, specifically data, what we do in data carpentry and here they are coding the visualization of data. They want to bring this uh, interestingly, primarily to female researchers. But um, if we see the Ethiopian approach, we have, uh, many more uh, male participants than female participants. And uh, now in Ethiopia, we also focus uh, on the TVET sector and TVET is very important for all African countries. You might know that. And um, the um, Ethiopian are, let's say the Addis Ababa TVET colleges, they want to start with this training. They want to do first uh, the, the presidents or the deans, that they understand what is behind the, uh, the R coding, the visualization, because the visualization is for decision-making purposes. And so there the management from the DVET agency, Addis Abeba, is very much convinced. Um, the, the management has to use data for decision-making purposes. And therefore they support us so much. And um, this is the message uh, that went also to, to Vakran, and they also want to do that. From the asynchronous approach, what we have been discussing for a while, it's that, that we want to set up a MOOC on uh, digital literacy, and uh, specifically then with the focus on R coding. So far, um, we have the platform, we have then to do the coding and we say it has to become an African approach. We don't want to have the Western teachers there. It has to be purely African. And we have the trainers in Ethiopia and uh, maybe we can also invite other trainers then to contribute, Speci uh, specifically if it comes then to um, software carpentry or library carpentry. And uh, we wanted to start with the first course on um, July 20, but now it's postponed for August. Uh, let's see when it will start. The interesting part is we use Moodle and the Moodle has also the possibility or the, the Moodle offers the app possibility. And with an app, we easily can go for, for the smartphones. 
I was told about that. I'm not an IT person, but I was told this is the way how we could use it. Yeah, all is in progress. We work on that. Now I hope very much uh, with internet access again to Ethiopia, we make also some step forward. Thank you so much, Margaret, and hopefully you can join us back on the continent very soon. I want to open up the um, floor to the panelists. Any other um, than what Margaret shared with us now, um, any portion of your workshops, was it asynchronous? Was there perhaps a asynchronous portion or component you added? Perhaps something you are looking into the future of adding into online workshops? David, I see you nodding. Can I um, put it over to you? Go <laughs> yeah, ahead. So yes and no, no, sorry, no and yes. Uh, no, I haven't had any asynchronous things so, so far, but I will have to do, not, maybe not for the carpentries yet, we haven't decided that yet, but we are looking into uh, this kind of activities for all the other teaching we are doing um, as, as a way to keep students not always in front of the screen. So one of the, um, one of the suggestions by one of the learning technologies in our uh, university was uh, use of um, audio as podcasts, audio resources, so things that you can make it, uh, that they don't need to watch the screen, the screen, the screen, that maybe they can learn by listening. And that may not fit very well in many of the work of the topics that we teach in the carpentries, but there might be some things like, for example, if I'm thinking of the HPC carpentry, they talk about why to use a, an HPC. So that's kind of an explanation that it doesn't need to be a person talking to you on the screen because uh, the words can be expressed in the same way through audio. So yeah, we're looking into that as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Martin Vorit, if you, do you have anything you would like to share on that aspect? I think um, the mental models in Jamboard was great, but I think next time I would like to actually prepare a presentation as well so that um, you know, it just stays there longer with them. I mean, certainly it's no, it's no actual um, substitute for having them draw, but you know, if they are going to be passive, then that does help them understand better than, you know. But then, I mean, it, it's a mixed bag because I felt like if I had static, um, if I had a static presentation, then I wouldn't actually be going over it again, right? I mean, I would do it once or I would point to the slide and I'd say, hey, this is the slide, it's beautiful, it's out there. Whereas here, you know, like without it, I was like, okay, let's let's wipe the slate clean and just go over it again. You know, so so the answer is I don't know. <laughs> like, um, yeah, there's a lot of I don't knows at the moment, and I think uh, this is the why it's great to having you guys here sharing with us, um, Martin. I just want to make sure you did not have anything to say on the matter. I'm just checking in, basically. Um, yeah, I would like to test it out, but as of yet, we haven't really tested it, so I can't really say anything about it. Maybe I was working through the stickies of the last um, um, online workshop in South Africa, and some of the learners were asking for homework. They said, please, can we have some homework to have uh, after every day so they can go and practice? And <laughs> I usually you wouldn't ask or something at the workshop, but that's something we can maybe implement in future um, maybe challenges or exercises we did not finish in, in the actual time slot, you know, because the solution's right there, they can work through and then the next day we can have a 30 minute discussion of that. That might be a possibility, right? Thanks. Um, over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Angelique. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing. Um, so I think in the interest of time, we would like to spend the last half hour um, discussing um, any questions that everyone else in this call may have, um, and also hearing from you the strategies you've tried, um, the things that have worked well, the things that you would like to change. Um, so if you raise your hand, we'll call on you because all the questions that we had have been answered. Um, Perhaps we can make use of the non-verbal announcements 
in Zoom, so you can just raise your hand if you have uh, any questions for our panel members. Thanks, guys. I have a question um, and I'd like to throw it out to everyone in this call. Um, in case you've been to an online workshop and written about it um, anywhere um, that you'd like to share, please drop a link for us in, um, in chat or in the etherpad um, and start a section shortly. And um, just for the benefit of everyone, we'll go away and read um, what you've written after this. Um, We'd really love to hear about all your experiences and read about them. So in case you've written or seen um, resources that will be useful um, for the Carpentries community, you can also drop them in, in chat or in the etherpad. I and think I have a question. Apologies, Sarah, I cut you off. Uh -huh. um, how did, what, it, I want to say, not approaches or methodologies or pedagogy per se, but um, what initiatives did you take to make your lesson more collaborative? Because we know in in person, it's very easy. Stickies and people, you can do little icebreakers, but virtually it might be a little bit different. I was wondering what initiatives do you take to make um, the session online more collaborative? I'm going to leave the room actually open, or maybe if someone has a, a great tip, um, just pop it into the chat as well. Um, I use the stickies trying to collaborative and I say, I wrote a blog post and I said, um, interrupting becomes very natural. So that's how I try to, I don't know, David, you nodding your head. I don't know any experiences on interruption from the United Kingdom. Well, not in an, an online session, but when I teach in, in, in a normal workshop, uh, I encourage I encourage noise in the room. And that's something that uh, I remember uh, from Greg Wilson in, 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 in different events that he was like, saying like, yeah, that's good. People are thinking, right? So you want that, that, that uh, background noise of people talking, which in the online world is kind of a, becomes less natural. Sometimes it happens on the chat. Uh, but sometimes the chat becomes too, too um, noisy and even distracting sometimes uh, for the instructor, for the people that they might not be, want to be part of that conversation, maybe, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's, it, that interaction is, is really hard to, to create. And that's where I suppose is the breakout rooms where you can uh, force that and, and I've been in other workshops or conferences like the Croatian workshop in, in UK, and that was great. The, the, the breakout rooms there was amazing, the use uh, of them during the conference, because it was separating people, running um, icebreaker sessions with certain questions to answer, and then coming back, and, mm -hmm. and that worked very, very well. But it was a two days conference. When you have only three hours to teach something, uh, ugh, the time there might, I mean, you have to consider a lot whether it actually is worth it. Uh, mostly when people have other things to do in their house and they don't really want to to waste much of the time if they can have to learn and learn. So I don't know. It's 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 a balance that I haven't found a a right uh, solution for that. Thank you for sharing that. I think you brought up a very valid point that uh, we most of us are working from home still, and. Um, the dog will bark and your two-year-old would not understand why mommy's on a call or daddy's on a call. And um, that brings up maybe how do you guys think we should make individuals and learners more comfortable um, in those? Because I've had my dogs going ridiculous. We have Ibis, this is called a Harida, and South Africans will know they make the most worst noise and they would just bark. And I just, please guys, just give me five seconds. I need to go quiet the dogs down. I feel a lot of people feel they have to apologize, but this is the reality we're dealing with, right? So any of you did something or found ways of reassuring people that it's okay if you have to quickly put your video off and run and go sort something out? I don't know. Anyone in the chat maybe want to share what experiences you had with that? Maybe some ways we can put people more at ease and make it more comfortable. Um, 
I, I don't necessarily have experience, but uh, I have a colleague that says he has a three-year-old daughter who's a little bit uh, ADHD. And he said, well, you can find me sane or sober, but not both at the same time at the moment. So we all dealing with weird stuff. Uh, myself, I have um, over-eager dogs. We, they bark at anything and everything that moves. So yeah, I do have the same experience in, in that matter. And I mean, we have to um, adapt. This is the new normal uh, at the moment. So we have to adapt and um, realize the fact that this is stuff that's going to happen. Nothing's going to be perfect. Uh, you won't have perfect silence in the background ever. Um, if, especially if you have small children or barking dogs or um, living next to a highway or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, just be a little bit more considerate towards each other and that, that would solve most of your problems. Agreed. Thank you for sharing so much. Um, Sarah, do you have a mm -hmm. comment? Go ahead. Um, Dan has a question, um, but it's on a different subject. So we'd like to close this, this one, this round of discussions, um, unless anyone wants to chime in. I want to say actually to Angelique mm -hmm. of how you do that is by saying it at the beginning of the workshop or at the beginning of the classroom of the class saying it's normal, it's okay, uh, you show the rules of the rules, uh, the recommendation of mute yourself, unmute yourself when you want to talk and if you miss something because you have to run because I don't know your dog is biting someone so be free to ask for help after when you come back or ask for for repeat some section, section and, and you know normalize that. It's it's, a, it's the way I find easier to 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 make that more uh, comfortable for everyone. Thanks, David. Um, Dan. Um, hello. Um, so my question was around like getting software installed um, mm -hmm. for the workshop that we did. Uh, we essentially the day before the workshop we have. Very, we had we also were lucky enough to have a bunch of instructors and co-instructors with the host people we ended up hosting like for an entire afternoon like a installation barbecue like thing where anyone that had installation issues can come in mm -hmm. um for something that's more asynchronous i this this will eventually go down to like the lesson maintainers uh conferences like scipy when you have a com uh, a workshop require you to have a installation script that runs to make sure that the student who's participating has everything that they need installed. Um, and I don't know if that's feasible or should be something uh, for the Carpentries workshops to, uh, I know we already have like the Windows installer, but like mm -hmm. something that that's like for every platform, for every lesson, um, that's more just like an open discussion. I don't know if people have been having a bunch of installation issues uh, because if it happens at the start of a workshop, that is mm -hmm. a lot of time that you won't be able to make up. That's a great question, Dan. Um, David? Yeah, so there is actually a script in the lessons in at least the was, but I've been using that still in the summer carpentry. Uh, there is a couple of scripts that it runs some tests and you can tell the students run that and that should work on, on uh, it check whether you have the shell, git and, and the leverage that you need for the Python lesson. That's an even SQL light maybe. Um, that's something I've been using in the past. I'm not familiar whether that's still available, but I normally have on my, works, my workshop page, I add another page after the setup and saying, try that to see whether, if you see these kind of things, it's work, it's working. You got the installation mm -hmm. right. Uh, nevertheless, we always have a, a, the day even, the day or the week before a, as you, as you say, a drop-in sessions for installation problems because we have them all the time. Like even if you give all the best instructions you can, you always get people that have a problem, which is not, it's not their fault because some, most of the time it's like the computer uh, is unable to install something for whatever obscure reason of that operating system and or that setup that they got and and it's it's a lot better nowadays <laughs> I must say but 
Yeah, there's a script somewhere there. I will try to find it and, and post it on the chat. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, anyone else want to chime in on installation help specifically and how they've um, maneuvered the challenges around um, needing to help people set up at the beginning so that they can take part in the workshop? Um, Rohit. So in, in a sense, mine is a little bit easier because I, I mostly taught the R part and there's our studio, which is great for like just spinning up machines. But um, I did notice that it was harder to keep. So again, bringing back to the same problem, it's harder to keep people focused. So mm -hmm. I would maybe try to debug an installation error and then five minutes in the learner would be like, no, actually now our studio cloud is working. And I'm like, um, okay, that's, that's great. I mean, anyone should work. But it's difficult to keep everyone in the same um, on the same page, you know, because you're not there and you don't know what they're looking at. And and of course, uh, Dan raises an excellent point, you know, to to just bring that forward is that yes, you should always be able to work on your local machine. But for some things, like I feel our studio is a great example of this. When it's exactly the same, there's no real benefit to um, doing it before the workshop and doing it later at your own leisure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're teaching, of course. Thanks, Rohit. Um, Colin says, um, I don't like the idea of doing this for teaching as I want people to set up their own systems, but it's now possible to run a Linux virtual machine on Binder Hub, um, and you can use that to run Python, R, Shell, Git, or SQL. Um, and he's shared, uh, Colin has shared a resource. Um, we'll add it to the resources list. Thank you, um, Colin. Did you want to voice anything else, um, Colin? That's okay if not. And uh, Colin adds that it's free. <laughs> thank you. That's useful. Um, so thank you um, for that question, Dan, um, and for the additional comment about um, still feeling it's important for people to get stuff on their local machines so they have something to take away. Um, Dan says nothing we teach has a difficult installation stack. So um, Dan's not sure if our studio cloud outweighs the usefulness of having things um, on people's machines. David, uh, what's the link? Oh, sorry, Dan, go ahead. No, it's me, Morten. Can I oh, join me in there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we used the online or I think the second workshop, am I right, Angelique? and the, the R cloud setup and we found that it helped a lot um, in certain cases and some people preferred the um, local machine but what we also um, I want to say encounter a lot is people buy uh, really under spec machines in terms of CPU power and RAM and stuff because it's the mm -hmm. bare necessity it's a cheap alternative to buying a, a, a expensive laptop so they buy a, a cheap laptop so um, in that case, when, for instance, if they have the really low spec PCs, the R Studio and, and, and um, R and R Studio does not really function that well on the local machine. So in that case, the, the cloud environment worked excellently. But then you also get the people that have high spec PCs and they prefer to do it on their, their personal computer. So it all depends on, on personal preference. Uh, it, you know, it comes down to personal preference or it comes down to um, necessity. So if it's necessary to use the cloud, they will go there. If not, then they will use it on the local machine. But what um, we normally do, what I personally normally do we, uh, the first day before we start with the workshop, I set out an hour before we start and then help individuals either in person or um, online, I help people to, to make sure everybody has everything set up. And then, um, for instance, the all workshops that we run, we do the spreadsheets open refine and then we do R. So the first day I'll make sure everybody has some sort of spreadsheet um, 
software and have OpenRefine and Java that along with OpenRefine. And then before we, um, I want to say, end the first day, we make sure everybody has R. So you don't have to have everything in, in the morning because then it, then it becomes quite cumbersome because you have to download a lot of stuff. And then what we also do sometimes is tell people that when we take a lunch break, you are more than welcome to sit um, with me for 15 minutes and I can help you if you still have issues with the installation. That's really great. Thank you, Martin. Um, that's, that's useful, um, starting from Open Refine going through to R so that people have a fallback um, in case of anything is is um, is good advice. Thank you for sharing, Martin. Um, I I don't see any hands, so I have a question for Angelique. Um, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about how you've been able to support learners in South Africa mm -hmm. to attend workshops. Um, with bandwidth limitations and things like that. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, I um, I sit in the fortunate position where um, I work closely with Sadilar, um, which is a member of, of Carpentries. And um, part of our, I want to say, um, our membership agreement is that we help and assist them with workshops as any other member in the Carpentries, right? But South Africa, we, and Martin alluded to this quite um, earlier, we have some internet issues. A lot of um, regions don't have fiber or wired internet like ADSL LAN. They have Wi-Fi, which is notoriously bad. If it's bad weather, your internet is down. But then there's mobile data, which is quite stable in South Africa, but really expensive. And um, the first online workshop we ran in South Africa, I did a little experiment of my own. I wanted to see how much does it, data does it take to stream your video online um, at, on Zoom. And it takes between 100, 200, or 300 meg, depending how, you know, is it the settings on HD? Did you put the make me pretty filter on Zoom? All those type of things. But that adds up. If you times that by eight and times two, it could be five gigabytes of data. Um, are probably minimum. So Sanilar, getting back to the membership and any other member, we pay for travel and accommodation. We aren't hosting in-person workshops at the moment due to COVID-19. And that funding is standing just right there. And um, Jean Stein and I had a discussion and we were trying to figure out how we can support learners and instructors to not only attend workshops, but to teach at workshops. And Sadila graciously offered to pay the mobile data costs of instructors and the learners. Um, it is a bundle. We have mobile data bundles. You could buy five gigabytes and the Northwest University, which Sadila is part of, they have agreement with the mobile networks of um, providers in South Africa, where if you um, give a phone number, they buy it for you. So there's no claiming back and you know all the administrative issues that goes with that. So we've been able to buy mobile data for South African learners. Um, it has not been expanded to the rest of Africa at the moment, but that is great. This enabled learners to attend workshops where otherwise they would have been excluded from attending these events. So that is amazing. Another part is we could help instructors learn how to teach online because giving them access to the internet and helping because they very excited. They're like, oh, this is a great opportunity. It's something I can add, but I just can't fund this on my own. And I'm glad we could from um, the carpentries in South Africa help them and fund them with that. So um, it seems like we won't be going back to a type of normal. I'm not sure what normal means anymore, right? Um, no, we don't. It's a type of normal until 2021. We're looking at the academic year being pushed out to March, perhaps. So any carpentry workshop in South Africa will probably be online. And until then, we have the funding from Sadilar, which is amazing. And I'm so glad we can help learners attend and instructors teach online workshops here. Any questions you guys have regard to that? I'll just have a look in the chat. 
There are no questions. Matthias okay. says um, Open Bioinformatics Foundation did something similar. They replaced the travel grants for other resources needed to participate in events. Oh, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. That is so great. If you're able to share a link, Matthias, that will be great. Um, Colin had a question, and I think it's going to be the last one for this call. Um, Colin asks, uh, let me find it. Uh, Colin says, I'm wondering how does everyone feel about continuing with online teaching if and when things go back to, in quotes, normal? What about blended online and in-person teaching? Any thoughts? Uh, if I may, uh, I think the blended learning approach is really the best approach. Uh, the um, online learning is um, quite good. I do it also for other subjects. Uh, that um, the learning from the in the classroom comes to, to the virtual platform, but uh, there are so many skills and attitudes we cannot um, teach online. Of course, we can teach um, teamwork, but it's also uh, social skills. Our, um, we work uh, on a non-verbal basis quite a lot. And uh, my background is, ground is from business and economics. And there it's very important to have uh, the cooperation, the nonverbal uh, communication, that um, also the international uh, or intercultural approach. Because, uh, for example, the others say yes, and the others say also yes. What is it? And uh, I think for, for learners, it's very important to have both. And I would say the routine should come to the virtual platform. And so uh, we call it then the flipped classroom and all that. And student-centered learning, uh, this should then come to the real classroom, to the face-to-face. -face. And this is also the common discussion right now in pedagogy, what we mm -hmm. could do. Thank you, Margaret. David, Rohit, Martin, any? I, I agree with what Margaret said. Um, I think it's a, there is the blended mall kind of, a, it's, it's very good. Um, I, I read the other day a rant on, on Twitter of someone saying that just because you had an experience, a bad experience on, on online teaching doesn't mean that online is bad. And in fact, uh, you, we, it's different, right? So uh, we will have to adapt to those things. I know that in my university next semester, it will be all online and I'm scared, but also excited because it will be a way to, to make the course different and try to make it better. Now, I, the good things I find about this, this lockdown is that I've been able to attend to a lot of conferences and a lot of things that I would have otherwise not been able to because everything was happening online and many of them were for free. So it was like, wow, everything is there. Now, then you have to find out the time to, to attend to the same when it's like 12 hours difference from where you are, but it's still, it, it, that, that brings people together. And kind of a, against of what Margaret said on, on, on interaction, I come from a, a, a lot of a background on open source communities and, and there we have had, I've been working with people there for years and years, which I never met in person. And we, I may consider that person a better friend than people that I met with them every day because we have that interaction. We have that, um, I don't know, that kind of connection uh, with people as well on the online world. And we have video conferences or we have chat rooms and stuff. So it, that's, that connection, that, that interaction can happen as well offline, uh, sorry, online. So what I think is, is different is something that not everyone is like, accustomed to those, those things. And the students may suffer at first uh, because they may not come with that uh, experience before, but I think it's, it's possible and, it, and it's great. So um, yeah. Blend it on the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Um, Kari had a hand. 
Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so my thoughts are that because we work very heavily with um, researchers and academic institutions and labs and things like that, I think a lot of times we um, think about teaching practices with that framing. Um, but I don't know if we also consider that for the, for the case of academic institutions, we're comparing ourselves to formats that are more semester long. And so for the Carpentries workshops, we can't think of our, our workshops are not, the learning objectives and the ultimate objectives of the, of the workshop are not the same as a semester long course. And so the approach and what we want learners to walk away walk away from the workshops with is gonna to be totally different than um, if someone were taking a semester long R course. So that's something also to consider when we're thinking about exactly community of practice. It's, it's also about being involved in it with the community. And so our approach needs, we need to make sure that in my opinion, we need to make sure that our approach continues to align with the overall goals of the workshop, which are around self-efficacy, confidence, belonging to a community and things like that. And as long as our teaching practices align with that approach, um, just making sure that our teaching practices continue to align with that approach, whether or not it's totally online or flip or whatever that looks like, making sure that the ultimate outcomes of the workshop are still you know, at the front, forefront of our mind. Thank you, Kai. Um, and that's a great note to end um, this session for today. We are five minutes to time, so this is a good time. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, because this session has been recorded, it will be available on the Carpentries YouTube channel um, in the next few weeks. So you will be able to revisit it and share it with others who didn't make it to this call. There's also a second session happening next week um, so be sure to look out for that and invite people to join in the discussion as well. Um, for anyone who's not yet um, in our Slack, um, I've shared a link in there. Um, please join Slack. It's, it's really helpful. It's where most of the conversations around online workshops and people's experiences have been happening. And so we'd be glad to have you there um, to answer each other's questions, um, to give each other's, uh, each other ideas, and um, to also share resources as we come by them. Um, have a good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for joining us today. Bye, everyone. <laughs>